Good evening. Dramatic video has emerged showing one of three brothers from Sussex who've been fighting in Syria. Amir Degayas, who's 20, talks about what he sees as a fight for his religion. Amir remains there with his youngest brother, aged just 16. Another brother, Abdullah, died in a street battle, shot dead six weeks ago. He was apparently fighting alongside a group linked to al-Qaeda. The boy's father, who lives at the family home in Brighton, says his sons want to go to Syria to fight a dictator. He now wants them home. But if they do return, they face arrest, as David Wood explains. I grew up in Brighton and I studied in Brighton as well. I used to study business studies in Brighton College and also used to work as well. He left his home to fight. It's a fight he took to Syria without telling his parents. And soon after arriving, the Brighton jihadist was joined by his two younger brothers. Their aim, to help in the brutal war against the Syrian government. The middle brother, 18-year-old Abdullah, was killed in April and is now seen as a hero. When he ran in, the army actually ran away and retreated. So he was killed for a really good cause and his death was a sign of martyrdom as he felt back and he laughed and he smiled. While back home in Brighton, their father watches this video knowing the dangers his sons are in. He can understand, he says, what they're doing but disagrees with the way they are helping. I am proud of what he's doing in the sense that he's helping or trying to help or he's willing to go out of his way to help the Syrians. Uh, but at the same time, I'm worried for uh, for his safety and the risk he's taking is too far, I think. He insists his sons haven't been radicalised and wants them to return home. And he says if they do, they pose no threat to Britain. No way any of the De Gea's family would be a threat to this country. It's thought hundreds of other Brits have joined the De Gea's brothers in Syria. And as the war continues and the fighting gets more intense, Amir believes he has more work to do. I came here to give victory for the people and make sure that they receive justice and we still haven't reached the goal yet. He knows, like his brother, he could die in Syria, but if he comes home to Brighton, he could face arrest. His decision is to stay and fight. David Wood, ITV News. In other news, two men have suffered burns during an explosion at a dry cleaner's in Poole. The engineers, aged 30 and 67, were working in the shop on Lower Blandford Road in Broadstone at the time. Both were taken to Poole Hospital. One was treated for facial injuries, the other for shock. Plans to build six wind turbines on farmland near Basingstoke have been rejected. Campaigners said the plans for the 130-metre turbines at Woodmancott would scar the countryside. A £500 million plan to extend Sussex University has been turned down. The university wanted to build new facilities for almost 5,000 more students, but the council says the current design would harm the character of the campus at Falmer. Now, too often we've seen the devastation caused when fire rips through a thatched cottage, destroying a much-loved home and wiping out centuries of history. But now a technique discovered in the south is protecting more and more historic properties. Yes, last year several thatched cottages in Hampshire were damaged by fire in a three-week period. One blaze completely destroyed three thatched cottages in East Meon. Fire brigades often point to wood-burning stoves as the cause of many fires. Well, this week, a cottage in Lulworth was saved because the roof had fire protection, known as the Dorset model. Richard Slee has more. This is a rare sight, the aftermath of a thatch fire where the whole building hasn't been destroyed by the flames. That's because the roof structure has a more modern design, what's known as the Dorset model. We'll strip back, put new timbers on, a fireproof boarding over those timbers and then thatch with one coat of reed on top of that and that makes it much easier if the fire does take hold for the fire brigade to deal with it and gives time for the people in the property to protect their themselves and their and their property. But the Dorset model isn't always popular with local conservation officers and the owner of the Lulworth estate says this fire has highlighted the conflict between building safe properties and preserving our heritage. Building regulations are obviously there to try and ensure properties are built properly um, and that people are kept safe. 
Uh, listed buildings aren't actually concerned about that. They want to maintain the character of a listed building, including all the ash poles and the old thatch and everything else. But this, as has been shown on numerous occasions, is actually a dangerous way to approach it. With thatched roof fires having the potential to cause such extensive damage, the Dorset model is also recommended by firefighters. By there being fire protection between the thatch and the roof space, we're just dealing with the thatch. Quite frequently there's much less thatch, it's not as thick, uh, so it makes it easier for us to strip the thatch off and a quicker resolution to the incident. Many cottages in this part of Dorset have thatched roofs, with most still being renovated using the traditional system. But that won't be the case when this neighbouring cottage needs new thatch in a few years' time. Over the past 20 years, every cottage on this estate that's needed a new roof has been rethatched using the fireboard method. And the estate says it has no intention of changing that, especially after what happened here. Richard Slee, ITV News, Lulworth. Another hospital here in the south has joined the colour revolution to help patients identify just who is treating them and who to ask for help. Nurses at Salisbury District Hospital have abandoned the light blue scrubs they all used to wear and have donned the different colours assigned to their roles. A change has been given the instant thumbs up by staff and patients alike as Penny Sylvester now reports. The team colours have changed at Salisbury District Hospital to make it easier for patients to know who's doing what. Green means nursing assistant. We can have cheese and beans with that if you would like. Maroon says you're part of the therapy and radiography teams. Can we pop this bit on? Light blue tells you it's a registered nurse looking after you. Specialist nurses such as infection control are silver, while the traditional navy is reserved for the person in charge. Patients are often seen by lots and lots of different people during their hospital stay. Um, some, of those some of those staff will visit um, wards and visit all the wards, other staff are here permanently. Um, so actually often in the situation perhaps where they want to see who's in charge of that ward, it's very important for them to be able to clearly see um, who they need to speak to so that they don't end up going through a range of people before they get the information that they want. You know who's who, where years ago they were nearly all the same. You can't just yell nurse all the time and it's, it's, I feel it's not right, you know, they need to be talked to properly. Just seven years ago, staff at the hospital were still wearing the traditional nurse's dress. They switched to scrubs, the more practical trousers and tunic, but they were all one colour, making it difficult to recognise different roles. Today those scrubs have been discarded and the new uniforms are smarter, better quality and have been welcomed by the nurses who wear them. It's meant that the uniform I spent a long time earning, I, I am wearing again, which is nice. When I first started at this trust, I went into the same colour as everyone else again, which was a new concept for me. Um, for my staff, I think it's really important that they can identify who their nurse in charge is on the ward. The feedback from patients has been the staff look like nurses again, and staff say they wear the uniform with pride. Penny Sylvester, ITV News, Salisbury. Yes, you are watching ITV News Meridian. We're delighted you are. Thanks for being there for us. Coming up. Is this the ultimate selfie? The 3D model of yourself you could soon be picking up with your weekly shop. As ever, for more on all of our stories, do head to our website, itv.com forward slash news forward slash Meridian. Any views or news, please call us. Here's the number 0808 10 10 095 or get in touch via Facebook. Or should you prefer it, you can always, of course, send us a tweet. More news and commuters from the south have been suffering long delays at London Waterloo this evening. No trains have been running in or out of Waterloo because of a reported trespasser on the tracks. Police have since apprehended a man and trains have started moving again. But South West trains say delays will continue until 10pm tonight. The latest travel information can be found on our website, of course, itv.com forward slash news forward slash meridian. He was told he would lose his leg, but thanks to pioneering treatment, his limb has been saved. Motorcyclist Clive Randall was badly injured in a crash and it seemed likely his leg would have to be amputated. But thanks to a new technique which involved part of his shin bone being regrown by stem cells, he needed only minimal surgery. Tom Savides now takes up the story. 
When Clive Randall was told his leg would have to be amputated, he was devastated. But now he's back on his feet after having pioneering stem cell surgery. His tibia or shin bone was badly broken in a motorcycle crash. Several attempts to fix it using traditional methods had failed. So he opted for a new technique where stem cells are injected into the bone. The fracture has now healed with the growth of new bone. To come out of that hospital and walk, it's hard to get your head around it. It's hard to think that one minute you've got, you're going to lose your leg, and next minute, I can't believe I'm walking. I said, and there, honestly, I'm so over the moon for, moon for what I've got. I've got my leg, got my life back. And this, this is the new bone? Yes, yeah, it's a new bone. Clive is just one of 30 people in the world to have this particular type of keyhole stem cell surgery for broken bones. The technique is the brainchild of Professor Anand Shetty. He has devised a technique where bone marrow is taken from the hip of the patient. The stem cells are then mixed with a special gel and injected into the damaged bone. As stem cells have the potential to interact and adapt to their new surroundings, they start turning into bone cells almost immediately. This new technique requires minimal surgery and takes just 30 minutes. Normal type of surgery, we have to open the fracture, then you need to take a bone graft. In spite of that, fracture will not unite sometime. This procedure takes a simple needle, aspirates your stem cells, and put it through a simple needle again as a day case. Around 10% of fractures simply do not heal, and some patients may need amputation. And that's where minimally invasive stem cell surgery could be used effectively. A similar technique is already used to repair damaged knee cartilage, but this is the first time severe bone fractures have been treated this way. This broken shin bone was completely healed within six months, changing the life of Clive Randall. Tom Savides, ITV News. Modern medicine, hey? It's amazing what they can Incredible. do. Amazing. Now it's coming up to 15 minutes past six. Time to find out what's making the national news headlines. With the details, here's Mark Austin. Europe turns its back on Cameron as the man he insisted should not be president of the EU is overwhelmingly voted through. The Prime Minister forced a show of hands and lost 26-2 with only the Hungarians for support. Yet another British student fighting in Syria explains why he went and what he's doing. One of his brothers was killed there. And a new warning on waiting times at A&E wards in England. Join Charlene White and me at 6.30. We will. Thank you very much indeed. Now, do you remember Fork Handles? Perhaps the classic comedy sketch of all time. You know, it's the one where Ronnie Barker wants to buy handles for forks and Ronnie Corbett thinks he means four candles, the type you light. Well, it was based on a true story and Ronnie Barker was never happy with that sketch. Yes, we know all about this because I went to meet Ronnie Corbett and his daughter Sophie, who's launching a new business in Brighton. And guess what she's calling it? Sophie Ronnie Corbett. Right. Lovely to be talking to you. Sophie, first of all, new boutique opening in Brighton on Sunday. Yes. And it's called? Four Candle Shop. Tell us where that idea came from. <laughs> uh, I don't know. There you are. Four Candles. No, Four Candles. That's where it came from, really. It kind of it seemed like the most obvious thing once somebody had said it. Yeah. It's history and... Did you ask my permission? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> and Ronnie Corbett, of course, four candles, uh, fork candles, everybody remembers yes. that particular sketch. Definitive sketch of Ron's that Ron wrote. No, uh, four candles. <laughs> candles for forks. <laughs> and it sprang from an idea. A hardware man wrote to Ron and said a man had come in and asked for four candles. And same confusion occurred in reality. Of course, the sheer disgust and my annoyance with every request he made and the journey I had to make the, up to the corner, <laughs> get the ladder up and get down in order to get up there for the peas and the queues. And getting crosser and crosser. <laughs> getting crosser, crosser and crosser. Crosser and crosser, that's right. He was never, we were never happy, and Ron, was, as the author, wasn't even happy with the end. I recently saw some footage of you at the unveiling of a statue of the late great oh, yes. Ronnie Barker. Yes. I mean, he obviously meant such a lot to you. Oh, gosh. Well, 
our careers both turned round at the same time. Ron had been doing a bit more than me, but when we got together on the Frost Report with John Cleese, that was the start of a major part of our careers. And um, we were together from then on, really. Good evening, it's wonderful Sophie, to be back with you. has it been difficult being, being the daughter of a much-loved television icon, a national treasure? I think that it, ha it has more pluses than minuses, but um, sometimes I, we have to kind of double-prove ourselves. And Ronnie Corbett as a dad? I look, he's an amazing dad. Ronnie, the extraordinary thing is, as you sort of approach middle age, you're well, working harder than ever, aren't well, you? Well, <laughs> can't even call it middle age. Um, <laughs> how old am I next birthday, 83? 84. 84. Yeah. Well, I'm not working harder than ever, but everything I have to do seems harder than ever. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I just do something completely unscripted that I always wanted to do, but never been able to do before. That is to say, it's good night from me, it's good night from her, and it's good night from him. him. <laughs> <laughs> After all those years, he had to think about it, didn't he? Brilliant, brilliant lovely, interview. Lovely man. Great interview, Fred. <laughs> now it's good evening from Sarah Gob. Here she is with us. What? Good evening, Sangeeta. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Well, Southampton Football Club say they will reinvest the transfer fee received today for teenager Luke Shaw back into the team. The 18-year-old defender has joined Manchester United in a deal believed to be worth around £27 million. It's the highest transfer fee ever received by the club. The Saints are also thought to be close to losing Adam Lallana. He's reportedly been at Liverpool today for a medical. Away from football, the Festival of Speed began in earnest today at the Goodwood Estate in West Sussex. This year's striking centrepiece marks the 120th anniversary of Mercedes-Benz involvement in motorsport. And today, more vehicles than ever before have been competing on the estate's famous hill climb. Now, in less than two weeks' time, the Tour de France will arrive in London, concluding two stages of the race taking part here in the UK. The Tour came to the south back in 1994, when the peloton set off in Portsmouth and made its way past some of our familiar landmarks. This year, it won't venture south and will begin in Yorkshire, from where our correspondent Greg Eastall has been finding out why it'll provide another massive boost for the sport right across the country. He cycled part of the route, setting off in Leeds. After a frankly lame attempt to pose like a top athlete in training, time to get pedalling. Like me, the tour will head out from the city centre, but the ceremonial start line is somewhere even more sophisticated. Harwood House, just outside Leeds, is where William, Kate and Harry, no less, will cut the cord for the official beginning of the tour. Thousands are expected here for a three-day festival of cycling over the race weekend with music and other events. And it's here I meet some British cycling royalty. Olympic gold medalist Chris Boardman wore the Tour's coveted yellow jersey three times in the 90s after winning three opening prologue stages. So Chris, you must be pinching yourself that the tour is coming to this part of the world. I think it's amazing that we've got another opportunity. I mean, I first did it back in 94 when it came to Britain and everyone went, brilliant, what's this? And they just <laughs> didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. And then people really liked it and they turned around and there was nothing for them. There was no services, there was nothing. Then of course we had it um, a, a few years ago uh, and that was, that was phenomenal in London. I worked on that and we really got our heads around it. Sure. But with all the success now, there's a way for everybody to get involved with sportives and things like that. All part of a sport, many admit, has changed their lives. My husband tells me to shut up about cycling. Oh yeah, really. Turn the Twitter off. <laughs> yeah, turn the Twitter off. It's Twitter, it's um, cycling every weekend. I follow the race route pushing north into the breathtaking Yorkshire Dales. Towns, villages, hills and moors where the tour will shine its spotlight to a watching world. It's a chance for the tourist trade to take full advantage and in whores I meet one lady determined to do just that. Helen Iveson couldn't bear the thought of boring merchandise so made her own using local artist Graham Ashbridge's sketches. They're proving popular even if some buyers struggle to say what's written on them. It's really interesting to listen to them actually 
it's trying to pronounce Uptill and Downdale. Um, some can, some can't, some are very confused. All part of the charm of another town getting ready for the tour. You can watch live coverage of those initial stages next month here on ITV. That's from Saturday the 5th. It's going to be quite a spectacle, isn't it? Look beautiful going through some of those villages. A pity it's not coming down here. It is a pity, isn't it? Next time, maybe. Yeah. Welcome back. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Now, go into most supermarkets these days and you can pretty much buy anything from food to furniture. But it might not be too long before a store near you offers you, the customer, something extra personal. Something that can only be described as the ultimate selfie. Are you intrigued? Don't be. Mel Barham explains. Just when you thought you knew what to expect on the shelves of your supermarket, something a bit different has arrived. Yes, amid the milk, and fruit. What about your very own mini me? This Asda has become the first supermarket in the world to install a full body scanner, allowing customers to create a 3D miniature replica of themselves. And this is it. It looks a bit like a scanner that you'd find in an airport, but there are no x-rays involved. It basically takes hundreds of photos of you over 12 seconds, which then builds up that 3D image. And in my case, that also includes baby bump. OK, I'm ready. is then built up on the computer and sent to the workshop to be printed and made up. They cost £60 each and can be turned around for shoppers to collect a week later. A lot of people coming in with children, holding baby on their shoulder and getting scanned together with mum and baby. Pregnant ladies coming in to, to be scanned to capture that moment of, of pregnancy and, and the bump. There's uh, grandparents coming in to give to their grandchildren. And um, we've had a full band in today with the guitars, bass guitars, drumsticks all wanted to be scanned. I've actually driven up from London yesterday and I'm supposed to be going back today, but I thought I'd come via Manchester just to have. I just think it's such an amazing thing to have. And I think it's just so nice you can actually see a little mini you for forever, really. And you've just got that one little shot of you at whatever age you were at whatever point in time. It's something new, isn't it? I've not seen it before. It's like having a little action figure of yourself, isn't it? You know what I mean? <laughs> the detail's pretty decent, but the price is quite high still. £60 for a model. It's curiosity with the little one, um, just because they grow up so fast with the being my granddaughter. It's something to keep instead of a photo. And here it is, my eight inch ceramic mini me, all ready to take to the checkout. The trial here has been so successful that they're going to roll it out to other stores across the UK by the end of August, meaning this year's stocking filler could be, well, you. Mel Barham, ITV News. Oh, I'd love some oh, yeah, of those, Yeah, I think you? you should get the yeah. whole room full done. <laughs> I want a few Simon Parkins. Why not? And Simon's joined us now for the weekend weather forecast, almost. We're going to get a bit damp, aren't we? I think we probably are, yes. Grab your wellies and your brolly. I'll give you the full forecast in a while. Here we go again. Anyway, we'll speak more on that in just a moment. First of all, though, I was intrigued by a letter in the Southern Daily Echo, which caught my eye this week. It's from a chap called Tony Jones, who lives in Totten, and concerns the old Meridian studio site in Southampton. Of course, it was home to independent television since 1958, but sadly, it's remained deserted and derelict since we moved out ten years ago. Now, though, there are plans for a new housing development there. Tony Jones suggests the builder chooses appropriate street names to match its rich television heritage. How about, he says, Baker Boulevard, in honour of the veteran weather forecaster Trevor the Weather. Baker, good idea. Or Wurzel Way, recalling the never-to-be-forgotten Wurzel Gummidge series, filmed by Southern Television, of course, and starring John Pertwee. Other suggestions? Hargreaves Gardens, a tribute to my much mentor Jack Hargreaves of out-of-town fame and the man who invented how, of course. Westwood Place, in recognition of presenter Barry Westwood, a great presenter who taught me so very much. And Mitchellmore Road, named after another great presenter, probably the best of them all, a real icon. Cliff Mitchellmore, who lives now near Petersfield and watches us most nights. Thank you, Cliff. The one I like best, though, Dinage Drive. I wonder who that's named after. A 
great idea, Mr Jones, and thanks very much for the thought. Streets ahead, you are, hey. Mr Dynage. Streets ahead. Bob, Bob. <laughs> Simon. D Dynage Drive, though, it'd have quite a sharp bend in it, because you do drive <laughs> us round the bend. Anyway, uh, <laughs> something we haven't seen for a while, some uh, clouds that look like other things. Have a look at the first one. Uh, no parking sign in Dynage Drive as well, no doubt, after that. But uh, look, that's Faye Jordan in Upper Basildon's Superman's S in a cloud. Isn't hey, that amazing? I like it. Uh, Brenda Meakin in Basingstoke spotted one that changed before her very eyes. Started out as... A little mouse. Rabbit. And then became... <laughs> A cloud? A little mouth. <laughs> we nearly got there at the end. Uh, Peter Cave in Bembridge on the Isle of Wight. Now, he found a cloud that is shaped like... An ultrasound. The Isle of Wight. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you can see it there, look. And uh, it's not, not going very well, 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 No, not at all. Cindy's husband, Jason Bainbridge... Oh, that's an saw eagle. this. An eagle. An Flying angel. High. An angel? Yeah, they yeah, saw it. Well, well, we'll let you have eagle. You can have that. Uh, Lee Mundy in Southampton. A perfect cloud, but... Don't be looking at the cloud. It's the heart it's the in the middle. Yeah, thank goodness hey, you got one. We're on form now. Uh, <laughs> Deborah Ardern in Corf Mullen. Yes. What do you think that is? That's, That's somebody a, with a, a bad a nose. A very old man's <laughs> face. <Bad> nose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, head, eyes, nose I and mouth, talk. she says. <laughs> and uh, David Hudson thinks that this one looks like... Oh, that's a little dog. Or a lamb or a deer, he <laughs> yes. reckons. But uh, we've also got one from Teresa that is like a spaceship as well. But I didn't think you'd guess that one right. <laughs> so um, lots of clouds over the weekend. If you see any interesting ones, Meridian Weather at ITV.com, please send them. And don't you drive us round the bend with a damp forecast this weekend. Let's find out. Simon Perky Parkin. That's us driving on, mm -hmm. us driving off in France. Mm -hmm. Here we are on La Plage. Oh. Driving to Europe, Eurotunnel Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Well, this was the scary sky Richard woke up to in Fareham this morning. One of those days, I'm afraid, and tomorrow will be one of those days as well. Our Met Office weather warning stays in place until 9 o'clock tomorrow night for more heavy, thundery downpours. You can see we've got a bit of a dry spell just now. A few more showers through the evening, particularly in the west. Lots of dry weather overnight, and then tomorrow the showers get going again. And we could easily see more than an inch of rain fall in a very short space of time. So at risk of more localised flooding through tomorrow. But for tonight, well, under the clear skies, that's where temperatures will dip down into single figures. There may even be a bit of patchy mist too. And come tomorrow morning, it'll be a, a dry start and a bright one as well. But that sun is going to get the showers going. And certainly through the morning, we'll see the showers start to develop. Light to begin with, but then turning heavier into the afternoon. And again, slow moving, thundery downpours to look forward to, with temperatures eventually climbing to around 18, 19 degrees. And those showers will continue through the evening as well. High tide times, well, you can see in Portsmouth, half past midnight and then just after one in the afternoon. And then the good news is that Sunday is looking a bit more calm. Should be a dry and settled day for the bulk of it, but some showers will turn up later. Ah. Eurotunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. The Pollen Count, sponsored by Checkertrade.com. Checkertrade, Checkertrade.com. Well, the iffy weather isn't all bad news because pollen levels tomorrow and indeed for the next few days will generally be moderate. However, be warned, they will start to sneak up in the best of any dry and bright spells. In just a moment here on ITV, we have the national and international news with Mark Austin and Charlene White. Stacey Paul's got our late news, but for now from the team here at ITV Meridian, thanks very much for watching. Have a lovely weekend and it's good night from me. And it's good night from him. And it's good night from them. Happy weekend. Good bye night. bye. <laughs>